At the back of the country, there are always the hills. They are called hills, though they're the highest mountain ranges in the world. The Karakoram and the Himalayas. Mile after mile of snow peaks stretching away far beyond the borders of Pakistan to distant Tibet. Every spring, as the year warms up, the snows begin to melt. The gullies fill with streams which join together, growing deeper and wider as they race down to the distant plains. So the great rivers of Pakistan, Indus, Jhelum, Ganges, Brahmaputra, carry the waters of the hills nearly a thousand miles away. Pakistan is a country shaped by rivers. This is schoolboy stuff, the kind of thing one learns in class. Geographically, you might think it unusual. It lies in two halves, in the east and west of the Indo-Pak subcontinent. West Pakistan is ruled by the Indus River. A thousand miles away is East Pakistan in the basin of the Brahmaputra and the Ganges. But Indus and Brahmaputra rise barely 70 miles from one another in Tibet. In the same way, people in West Pakistan speak Urdu and those in East Pakistan speak Bengali. But though each half writes differently and has different traditions and different climates, all are Pakistanis and are united at one source, the noble faith of Islam which flows through east and west as the mighty rivers do. Islam is the faith which inspired the founder of the country, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. His life work was to create Pakistan as a modern state symbolized by the crescent and star carved on his tomb. It's a big country and hard to compress into a little space. How can one give a bird's eye view which spans from the plains in the west to the tropical forests of the Chittagong Hills in the east, and which spans not only distance, but time too? These bricks, they were not laid 40 years ago, or even 400. This city of Mohenjo-Daro was flourishing 4,000 years in the past, the seat of the great Indus civilization. Citizens padded down these streets, lived, worked, and died in these houses, when most of the rest of the world was struggling in grass huts. A hundred or so generations ago, these streets were laid out with main drainage running under them. There was a great pool which was carefully made watertight with pitch. One can still just trace the powdery layer of bitumen, imported even then from the oil-rich lands of Mesopotamia. In the museums can be seen the jewellery which the long-gone Indus Valley women wore. To judge by the little toys and trinkets which have been found, Children must have been much the same then as now. There were bullock carts in Mohenjo-Daro, and even today, carts built on the same style can be found in this part of the country. Human tradition dies hard. Now, as then, the whole economy rested on water, on the great river. Here in the Sindh, all is very cut and dry. Where there is no water, there is still desert. Nothing grows where the camels pick their way in the sand.
But where the water is brought, just as far and not an inch further, there the land springs to life. There are fields, orchards, farms, a place to live. And this is something which the Pakistani nation is working hard to extend with the techniques of the modern world. A whole new network of huge canals is being created to link the rivers and spread their waters more effectively. When the gigantic Indus Valley scheme is completed, it will bring thousands of new acres under the plough. Barrages are going up across the rivers to hold the waters of the Indus and its tributaries and store the summer floods of the melting snows for the dry months of the year. New dams are using the water to create industrial power. Wasak and Manga. These are names which mean electric power for the workshops and factories of a modern nation. Industry is building a new and more sophisticated pattern which needs the old skills for new problems. Modern cotton mills make more and better cloth. In East Pakistan, there are factories to spin and weave the jute, which has long been the staple crop. Everywhere, factories go up to meet the demand for new goods of all kinds, the things that a modern industrial nation requires. Precision tools, surgical instruments, drugs, foodstuffs and medicine, household and sporting goods. There are now factories turning them all out, even the cables which distribute the electric power. In farms and villages too, this power network is making things possible which the villagers' forefathers couldn't have imagined, whether it's a pump for irrigation or electric light in the house. But in East Pakistan, water and rivers loom large in a different way. Here the problem is not so much how to bring water to dry fields, as how to cope with an abundance and arrange proper distribution. For four months in every year, the monsoon rains flood the lowlands to overflowing. The river deltas of the Brahmaputra and Ganges make a landscape of their own when fields, water and sky merge together. It's an agricultural landscape. Jute and rice are the main crops, for they thrive in the hot, moist climate and the fertile river silt. The 
there are waterways instead of roads, and jute is loaded here for dispatch to many distant countries. Boats ply between village and village, carrying traders and their goods. More than half Pakistan's population lives in this water-filled green land. The cities of East Pakistan are growing too. And to match the growth, both East and West need more and more universities and colleges to train the men and women who are going to use all this modern technology. Doctors, nurses and hospitals are needed too. Everyone is in a hurry and there are ideas of all kinds to be developed and put to use for this land of almost 100 million people. In a new country like Pakistan, which is expanding its capabilities, this new skill generation of citizens is probably the most important resource. The modern world increasingly unites the country too. Dhaka and Kulna were two days apart by boat. Now a helicopter does the trip in 30 minutes. Big jets put Easterners and Westerners only a few hours distant. And Dhaka in the east becomes the neighbor of Karachi in the west, 1,200 miles away as the jet hops. Pakistan International Airlines announced the arrival of their interim jet flight from Dhaka. Passengers will please proceed to the arrival lounge where they can reclaim their baggage. The streets of Karachi, or any of the larger cities for that matter, are very like streets anywhere, though you may see some distinctive forms of transport now and then. But a river runs through the city streets as well, the river of humanity. They are united by many strands, and though the impact of the modern world is very strong, they are proud of their traditions and crowds. Go into any of the crowded, jostling bazaars of the old town and you can feel a real sense of vitality which no one would want to lose. You can find almost anything here from copperware to a pair of golden slippers. The silversmith is at work with blow lamp and tongs. In the cool shade of the jeweler's market, they may be measuring out a dowry in gold, as yellow as saffron. Dhaka muslin was a name widely known centuries ago. The same patience and skill are needed today to weave the delicate, transparent patterns. Cotton, but as fine as silk. East or West, these are crafts which really do flow from the people. They have an instinctive gaiety and color, which runs like a clear stream through the life of the country. The endless movement of the streets is always washing against landmarks from the past. Mosques with quiet courtyards, where time runs slowly. But there's one place where the river of history is channeled into a presence one can almost feel. It is a pass in the hard brown mountains of the northwest, the Khyber.
Near the Khyber Gate, there is an inscription which tells the history of the pass, the channel for hundreds of years between the plains of Pakistan and Afghanistan and the world beyond. This was the northwest frontier of chivalry and romance, familiar all the world over from the stories of Rudyard Kipling. The crests of famous regiments of days gone by are still there on the rocks by the roadside, recalling the martial past. All is quiet now. Metal road and pack trail are used by peaceful travelers. Across the Khyber came the Persians, the Patans, and of course, the Mughals, the line of great emperors who gave the finishing touches to the cultural pattern of this country. The great Bad Shahi Mosque in Lahore was built by the Emperor Aurangzeb. It shows the taste and delight in beauty which matched the statesmanship of the Mughal line in the days of their power. In the fort of Lahore, state apartments were built which were as intricate as jewel boxes, decorated with inlaid mosaic in all colors of the rainbow. Great and wise rulers lived here, and the poet philosopher Iqbal, who lies buried in Lahore, spoke of them when he wrote on the bank of the river Ravi, in solitude far off, magnificent, those towers stand, where the flower of Mughal chivalry lies asleep, no mansion but a melody of silence. They created gardens like these in Shalimar, where the Emperor Shah Jahan and his court could stroll, and marble pavilions where he could relax and watch the moon rising over the treetops. Most of all, these people loved water, fountains, pools, and cascades. Even here, among the palaces of old Vahor, the rivers still flow. No one has matched the Mughals in architecture, but something of the spirit of the Mughal builders is being brought to bear today in the construction of a modern city, Islamabad, the state capital of Pakistan. We have to think in decades if we want to imagine it complete, but architects from all over the world are being drawn in to plan and build it. On this site, among the foothills near Rolpindi, is rising a brand new city. Islamabad is a city where everybody can share in spaciousness and order. It's a place to celebrate, and Pakistanis know how to celebrate when the occasion calls for it.
Horse and Cattle Show at Lahore is one of the festivities which takes place every year. Although its main purpose is to bring together the best that breeders and farmers do from all over the country, it's the occasion for all kinds of jollity, with dancing camels and horses and riding displays of the kind enjoyed ever since horses first ran wild on the plain. show is the biggest in the country, but it doesn't grow from nothing. Scratch any man in the countryside and you will find the horsemen. Sagadar, Lylepur, Montgomery, these are the names which mean horsemanship in this part of the country. horsemanship reaches its peak and indeed the game itself was evolved among the hills of northern Pakistan. In these same mountain valleys where polo was born, the old manly sports still draw strongly. Horsemanship, hunting, fishing. They have to do with affection for the land and a delight in hills and valleys and natural order. and mountains often seem to breed a special spirit in men. Here the very essence of this spirit animates the Patans, the hill folk of the northwest frontier. Gallant, tough, spirited, they can still perform a Katak saw dance with a dash and spirit that no one else can equal. East and west, the great rivers dissolve themselves in the sea. In the east, the snows of the far hills spend themselves in the mysterious swamps of the Sundarbans. In the west, the sea laps the port of Karachi. A new day breaks. 
and the morning calls to prayer reach out across distance and time, uniting brother and brother, past and future.